All right, gonna continue with Bill Wallace's Aloha Summer. We are in chapter 14. I thought the Garden of the Gods was weird, but Daddy had it beat. He was the weirdest looking thing I ever saw in my life. He stood in the middle of the living room in his boxer shorts. Around his middle, he had on a pair of thick leather chaps with his bare legs sticking out. Even though it was dark outside, Mama was a bit embarrassed that he'd been out running around in his underwear. She couldn't believe he'd run down to Mr. Munro's barn with nothing on but his shorts and a work shirt. Still, neither of us could keep from laughing. The harder we tried not to, the worse it got. The worse it got. I ended up rolling on the couch, holding my belly. Mama ended up sitting on the floor. Daddy just stood and looked at us. He tried to act disgusted, only I could see the little sparkle in his eye. Don't care how silly it looks, he sneered. If they work, it's worth it. The way that Daddy explained it, some of the men wore three or four pairs of pants or overalls when they picked the pineapples. He said some of them were layered and packed in so tight that it looked like their eyes were going to pop clean out of their heads every time they bent over. Tomorrow, he'd put on one pair of overalls with a thick leather chaps over them. If they worked, he'd get Paul Jacobs to call Mr. Monroe, have him stop by the Parker Ranch before he left the Big Island and bring back enough for Daddy's and Jose de los Santos' work crew. It sounded like a right smart idea. Still, looking at him standing there with his white skinny legs sticking out from one of them cowboy chaps, I couldn't keep from laughing. Carol, I mean Kalola, she laughed too when I described him to her on the ride to school Wednesday morning. Then I asked if her parents had ever done stupid stuff like my daddy did. My parents are dead. That's all she said. Made me feel bad. I mean, I knew she lived with her grandfather. I should have figured something had happened to her parents. Only I just didn't think. I kept feeling worse all through the day. At noon, she didn't join the other girls for their pog game. She sat alone on the swings. Tatsu, Shintaro's little sister, sat with her for a minute, for a time. They talked, but I could tell Kalola's mind was a million miles from playground. I wanted to tell her how sorry I was for saying something that reminded her about her parents. I wanted to let her know that I understood. Not just that I was sorry, but that I really understood what it was like to lose somebody. There were other kids on the playground, and with other people about, I couldn't. So I spent the rest of recess standing around, just as alone as she was, watching Ted Jacobs throw the ball on the roof and catch it when it rolled down. Shipwreck Beach was kind of neat. We crossed the hump, that's what Kalola called, the top of the island, and followed a dirt road down toward the sea. The road turned to the right, only we went left. There was a sandy beach there and some big chunks of wood lying all over the place. We left Ginger grazing on one of the sand dunes and walked around for a closer look. The chunks of wood were boards. At one time, they had been cut and sanded smooth. Now they were pitted and scarred by the wind and sand that swept across the beach. We found what looked like the old hull of a ship. Some of its wood was so thick that I couldn't even get my hand around the end of it. We climbed and pretended we were sailors on a whaling ship or something. Kalola said there were other wrecks along the beach, but it was getting late, so we didn't have time to play or explore. It was hard to ignore how quiet my friend was on the ride back home. I'm sorry, I said something about your mom and dad, I apologized. I didn't mean to bring it up. I didn't know it was going to hurt you so much. It is okay. She patted me on the shoulder. I was a little girl when they died. I don't remember them too well. Not remembering them made me hurt inside. With my weight in one stirrup, I twisted around on the saddle so I could look at her. Did they get sick or something? No, a fishing accident. There was something in the way she said, fishing accident, that bothered me. Something that let me know she was hiding something. Not telling me all there was to tell. At the same time, I didn't want to hurt her again, so I let it slide. We rode quiet for a time. Ginger plodded along at a nice steady pace. She seemed to know the path. I put my weight in one stirrup again. Only this time, instead of just turning my head around, I lifted my weight with my hands, dragged one leg across the seat, and ended up sitting backwards in the saddle. Kalila looked a little startled. I guess she'd never seen anyone ride backwards. Only for some reason, I just had to be facing her, looking her square in the eye. I had a little sister once, I began. Her name was Betty. Had a grandfather, too. Don't think I much wanted a little sister, not at first. All she did was cry and wet her diapers. Then when she got a little bigger and started walking and stuff, she was all the time getting into my toys. I didn't like her much then, either. Only she kept getting bigger and sort of got to be fun. We played chase and laughed. I loved to listen to her giggle. She gave me little hugs and stuff all the time. Full of devilment and just cute as a bug. She was so alive and full of life. Then the next minute, she was dead. I... I never knew how much I could miss her, not until she was gone. I dropped Kalola off at her home, and I was nearby, nearly halfway up the hill when it hit me. Kalola Pukwai was my best friend. We had really only known each other for two weeks. Still, we were best friends. Charlie Eagle was my best friend. He knew about Betty and Grandpa. Like most neighbors, he knew how they both come down with what the doctor called rheumatic fever, both on the same, the very same day. He knew the doctor had given them medicine, 
but warned us that there wasn't much else he could do, and Charlie knew that Grandpa died, and two days later Betty passed away. All our neighbors knew that. Most all of them came to the funeral. But I'd never even told Charlie how much I missed them, especially Betty. I never told him how much it hurt inside and how unfair it was and how I got mad at God and got to feeling sorry for myself and cried myself to sleep a bunch at night. I never told none of that to nobody. To anybody, not even my best friend. And I never, never, ever cried in front of him. Even if she was a girl, and I ha hardly ever thought of Kalolo that way, but even if she was, she was still the best, best friend a guy could ever have. <clears throat> All right, going to continue chapter 15. Some friend you are, I snarled. Carol Kalola glared at me across the seat of the saddle. Her big brown eyes were almost black. She had them scrunched down so tight that they were only tiny slits in her face. I jerked the cinch and flipped a leather strap across the saddle. Carol flipped her side, the buckle across the seat. We stood and glared at each other for a moment more before I yanked the saddle off and hung it in Mr. Monroe's shed. Ginger pitched and bucked as soon as Kalola took her bridle off and led her into the pasture. My friend was still glaring at me when she came to hang the bridle over the saddle horn. Some friend you are, I repeated. There ain't no way I'm going out in the ocean in no boat. Every time I get on a boat, I end up puking my guts out. Get sick as a dog. I ain't going on no boat. I ain't going out in the ocean. I ain't even getting near the dumb ocean. For two weeks, all John Piddle talks about is catching a big fish. I asked M M Macaulay. Macaulay, and he said okay. She threw her arms up. Now John Pearl does not want to fish, wants to throw a big baby fit instead. I ain't th throwing no baby fit. I just didn't know we had to go out in the ocean. She got a real smart Alec look on her face and wobbled her head back and forth. You think fish swim up on bank and we go pick them up? You think fishing means we dig around in the sand to find fish there? No, I sneered back at her. I just thought there was like a pond or lake or something. No lake, no pond. You want fish? Go to ocean. No way. She put her fists on her hips. Fine, I'll tell Grandfather John Prittle is a big sissy, and I, I jabbed my hands on my hips. Don't you be calling me no sissy. Sissy, she sneered. I mean it. My hands drew to fists at my side. Sissy boy. Carol, I ain't kidding. Sissy, sissy, sissy boy. My hands flew out against her chest. I shoved as hard as I could. She staggered back a couple of steps, then landed flat on her butt in the dust. It really surprised me when she bounced right back up. It was like she had springs in her bottom or something. One second she was on the ground, and the next her hands slammed in my chest. Guess it's part of being best friends. I spent the whole morning wanting to beat the tar out of her. I hated her guts. By noon I had cooled off. By the time we got back, caught Ginger and threw the saddle on her. Well, I guess best friends are like that. One minute two fellows can be madder than the devil at one another and fighting. The next, well, you're back to being best friends, just like nothing ever happened. Best friends also let you off the hook when they bested you. Sorry I knocked you down, Kalola said when she swung up behind the saddle. It's okay. You didn't push me all that hard, I lied. Just tripped over a rock or something. From the corner of my eye, I saw her nod her head and smile. Yes, same rock got me. <laughs> By the time we got down the hill, Kalola had, made, had me convinced that maybe, just maybe, I could survive being out in the ocean. She said they would stay mostly near the reef. A reef was a shallow place out in the water that broke up the big waves. She... All, she also assured me we'd stay close to land. She would have her grandfather bring something she called ginger root that would help too. And if I still got sick after all that, she promised that they would bring me back to the shore. I made her cross her heart and pinky swear. She didn't know what a pinky swear was, not until I showed her, but that's what best friends are for. Taking her grandfather up on his offer to come eat some poi, rest and visit for a while would be a good idea too. Never talk business around the poi bowl. Kalula went over the rules. One last time before we got to the house. Use one, two, or three fingers. Never just the tips. Just, oh, use one, two, or three fingers. Just the tips. Don't bury your hand in the poi. Never pull your hand roughly through the poi. Turn the fingers and gently put to your mouth. Do not say thank you when you are finished. Eating poi sounded more like a ritual than just sitting down to eat. Kalola went over every single thing I needed to do or not do. She told me everything. Everything except how nasty poi tasted. Kind of a pinkish gray color, it had a texture like school paste with just as, about as much flavor. It was all I could do to get it down, and hard as I tried, I couldn't keep my nose from crinkling up. I don't think Mr. Pukui noticed because he kept right on talking about the weather. Kalola must have seen how much trouble I was having, though. She excused herself, walked to the cabinet, and got down a large bowl. 
She poured some sugar from it onto a smaller bowl made of polished wood. I like sugar with my poi sometimes, she said, bringing the bowl to the table. It is not the best way to enjoy poi. I hope you do not mind. Without her grandfather seeing, she glanced toward the sugar bowl and gave me a little wink. I don't mind, I said, trying not to sound too desperate. I might even try it that way myself. I watched as she dipped two fingers into the pinkish stuff. She touched the gooey mess into the sugar, coating it just a bit, then put it gently to her mouth. I did the same. Only instead of just a dab of sugar, I coated it all over. It helped. The poi was still terrible, but at least I could swallow without gagging. I ate it real slow, hoping Kaloa and Mr. Pukui would finish most of it off so that I wouldn't have to. Eating poi was a whole lot like fence hanging. That's what Daddy called it when farmers got together. That's because they'd kind of hang or lean on the fence when they talked about the weather or crops or important stuff like that. After an eternity, we finished the poi. I almost said thank you, but caught myself and remembered. Instead, I told him that the poi was very good and I felt rested. Now I had to start home. Mr. Pukui followed us out onto the wooden porch. I untied Ginger's reins and stuck my foot in the stirrup. My granddaughter tells me you like fishing, he said. I nodded quickly. Yes, sir, I sure do. Come tomorrow. We go for Ulua. You have goggles? I frowned. What? Goggles help Kalola get bait. I cocked my head to the side and glanced down at Kalola. What's English for goggles? I whispered. Her mouth twitched from side to side. She tilted her head one way, then the other, like she was thinking on it. Really hard. Goggles, she answered finally. Couldn't help notice the little twinkle in her eye. She turned to her grandfather. John Priddle does not have goggles, she answered for me. Mr. Pukui walked right up next to Ginger and stared up at me. His leathery, wrinkled brow looked like canyons as he studied my face for a long time. Finally, he smiled. We have extra. Take some work, but we fix for him. Maybe fish later. I guess I was so excited about getting to go fishing, it made the ride back up the hill seem like it took forever. I will not be a girl when I am with you. The memory of her words that first morning on the ride to school crept into my head. Just hearing them inside my skull made my eyes blink. A smile tugged at the corners of my mouth. Darned if she didn't manage to pull it off, I mused. She really isn't a girl when she's with me. I blinked again. How about that? The thought of having a best friend who was a girl, but who really wasn't a girl, well, it got me clear through supper and a long, restless night of flipping and flopping in bed. It got me through the ride down the hill to the Pukui house. It got me clean through, up until that moment when I called to let Kalola and her grandfather know I was there, and until she stepped onto the front porch. Then all of a sudden, there was more girl than I ever saw, ever imagined seeing in my whole entire life. Hmm.